everybody's different and I think everybody should really feel free to go out and advance their clinical education, but it has to be done at the appropriate time. What I see people do is they're a phase zero practice. Their overhead is 70 to 80%. There's no money in the bank at the end of the month. And so they think, well, the one tool that I know is that I could produce more if I get this advanced clinical education. That's the wrong order. It's not necessarily the, the wrong tool. It's just the wrong time to utilize that particular tool. Good day, everyone. This is Dr. David Phelps of the Freedom Founders Mastermind Community and the Dennis Freedom Blueprint Podcast. Bringing back um, an old friend. Well, he's actually young to me, but uh, he's an old friend to, uh, to many people in the industry, and that's Dr. Mark Costas. Mark, good to see you, sir. Hey, good to see you, David. Oh, my gosh. Every time I get to hang out with you, I, I get excited. Saw you on my schedule this morning. Brought a smile to my face, as always. Well, I think that's that's part of the fun that we get to have. And I want more people, you know, in our industry, our colleagues to have that fun. And, you know, I certainly remember back in the day when I had a practice, uh, you know, there were certain patients and procedures, you know, you just like, you know, just it, it was just like uh, brought the energy out. Right. And then you see yeah. that one Mrs. Jones, you know, and it just like took sucked it out of you. And just, so same way, it's like I look at my calendar every day now and I'm just you're privileged to get a chance to, to, to talk to people like you uh, because you're such a, a great thought leader and in influencer in the marketplace. Very few people do not know who you are, but I think it's only fair because there's always a few people who are maybe uh, younger in career and maybe haven't had the chance to hear. So I want to give a little bit of your background, uh, not to be repetitive, but I think it's important because background story is a lot of part of who we are. And I think people live and identify through our stories, being authentic about them. And I know you're very authentic about yours. Uh, Mark is a first yeah. generation American born in Poughkeepsie, New York, received his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California, San Diego, his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from the Marquette University School of Dentistry. Following graduation from school, dental school, he founded the Horizon Dental Group, which quickly expanded into a collection of six successful dental practices in Arizona. Since that time, uh, he has been able to profitably exit or transition out of four of those practices, retains now uh, and owns, owns and operates the remaining two practices, which are in Prescott Valley and Chino Valley. 2006, so this is pretty early on in your, your career, you wrote a dental assisting school curriculum, which is, that's really, I think, where I, I first was engaging with you back at that time, because you were, you would really ramp that up. Uh, you submitted to the Arizona State Board of Post-Secondary Education, which was a requirement. Uh, the goal was to create a program that would allow you to operate a dental assisting school out of your facility during practice downtime, which um, we could talk about that some today because I think that was there was a lot that came out of that. Once that program was approved by the board, you had a proven template that you could use to assist other dentists to open their own dental assisting schools. And from that one small school that you started, the Horizon Schools of Dental Assisting was born. Since that time, the company experienced meteor meteoric growth well over 90 locations from coast to coast. And, you know, that's part of who you are inherently because you're always looking at, well, how can you solve problems that like most of the other people can't solve? You know, you see a problem, go, well, how can I solve that? And I, feel, I know that's how the school came about. The other part of your bio, and I'll stop after, after a little bit here, but during your experience of developing multiple dental practices and founding this national company of, of, of dental assisting schools, you, you say, I've made many mistakes. And I'm going to come back to that, so I won't stop there, but I'm going to stop, come back to that. But with each mistake came a learning experience that served to improve my understanding of what it takes to run a profitable business. Real-world trial and error, self-study, and surrounding yourself with some of the best mentors that you can has given you a unique perspective in the management of successful dental practices. Now you have a consulting and coaching company, the Dental Success Institute, uh, also developed to help dentists overcome the frustrations of dental practice ownership and bring practices to the next level, which is so badly needed today because we come out of school, most of us, without any business acumen, any business training, and we hit the ground trying to figure this stuff out, right? You, you're no different. You hit the ground running, trying to figure this stuff out, um, expanded to six schools, and then created this curriculum. What, what was your, I just want to go back in time, what was your drive um, to create something, I'd say a little bit bigger than the vision of most dentists, um, you know, out of the gate. What was what was your drive to do that? Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the question and and the the historical bio there. Uh, just a couple things, just to update you before we move on. Um, I've recently exited uh, clinical dentistry about six okay. weeks ago. I sold the last four practices. I uh, Horizon Dental Group got up to sixteen uh, dental practices, and. Um, uh, I was able to successfully uh, transition out of all of my dental practices as of six weeks ago. Uh, wow. At the same time, I 
hung up the handpiece. And uh, the Horizon Schools of Dental Assisting was my first kind of foray into um, national kind of uh, entrepreneurship. We, we got up to actually 200 locations for the Horizon Schools of Dental Incredible. Assisting. And, um, you know, uh, most definitely, to your point, I, I've made just about every mistake you could possibly make uh, during uh, the building of uh, all of these entrepreneurial ventures. Um, I kind of went in blindly, ready, fire, aim was kind of my my battle cry through through most of my um, my entrepreneurial journey, but you know, entrepreneurism, entrepreneurialism was kind of in our blood. Um, I felt as though my dad sacrificed his dream to be an entrepreneur in order for a stable livelihood for us. He was an electrical and mechanical engineer. Uh, got a great job right out of the gate. Um, he was he was an immigrant from the uh, from the Philippines. Right out of the gate. He got a great job with IBM and stayed with them for 30 years. And and to to everybody back home in the Philippines to him, I mean, he was the most successful person in generations because he made it to the United States, first one, uh, started with a hundred bucks and then created this incredible life for his family here and sent a bunch of money back to the Philippines. So in order to do that, he had to kind of rack his um, and put his entrepreneurial dreams aside. But, you know, common discussion at the dinner table from the time that I can remember all the way back to when I was probably seven or eight years old was about business, uh, about entrepreneurship, about how to not trade dollars for hours, which he felt he was doing for his entire life. So he, you know, he was able to flex his entrepreneurial um, uh, muscle just a little bit with working f for and with me. He got his contractor's license, even though he was working uh, full time and helped me start um, developing and building out den dental practices, whether they were acquisitions that we were remodeling or, uh, or ground up startups. Uh, so he was able to do that with me. So that was kind of in my blood. We, we, we were always obsessed with entrepreneurship, personal development in my house. My very first book that I ever read was Think and Grow Rich that I got from him and his study. I, I kind of picked it up and and that kind of just molded the way that I thought for for my whole life. Uh, never knew uh, that it would end up here, but I knew that I wasn't going to be somebody that would be a successful employee for the rest of my life. Well, that's that's such a great story, and I I know your your father uh, passed not in the in, in the recent recent past, and and it's I I've got to think that you know the pride he has to have um in you and the fact that he got to work with you even though he had to dampen his entrepreneurial spirits um you know getting a good safe secure position here in the states to allow for um his family to uh, you know elevate in this society but the fact that he got to work with you and you with him um that that's got to be something that will always be a, a great a great memory for you to ha have that um because he's still instilled in those values that he maybe couldn't totally extrapolate himself but through you he was able to do it yeah, he was a very special person. We had a very close relationship. It was recently we recently um, celebrated his one year uh, since since he passed away. But it wasn't a sad uh, occasion. Uh, it was a big party uh, celebration of his life, and we put his ashes in his in their final resting place. But um, yeah, often, almost every day, uh, I'm reflecting on on lessons that I learned indirectly through his uh, through his um, example. Uh, he wasn't, he didn't talk a lot. He wasn't, he was just a very stoic, mm -hmm. but loving person. Uh, but I learned from example, from his example, not necessarily from him sitting down and say, here are the, here are the six tenets of a successful life, Mark. We never had discussions like that. Right. It was just, I got to, I got to watch and emulate um, some of the, the ways that he lived his life. I, I think there, I think there's a book there, Mark, when you, when you feel <laughs> inclined, I think, no, seriously, I think there's a book there. Um, Maybe it's something you you just keep within the <clears throat> excuse me. Maybe it's something you just keep within the family. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, it just seemed like there's something there. I'm not I'm not trying to provoke you into something you don't want to do, but uh, it might be something. It's at the right time. Anyway, let's go. Let's let's jump back. I want to go back to you know we know that an entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur, you, your father, other people we know, it is a position of having to take risk, having to do the trial and error, of being willing to accept making some mistakes and having to course correct and figure things out or get the resources of other people who have gone down that path and can help us course correct. And yet in dental school, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> we are taught to 
measure and check and you know, four times before we pick up the handpiece or go to cut, right? Uh, so I'm just curious. I don't know about you, but but I mean, dental school, dentistry, dentistry is great. Dental school, not so much. Um, and I always had the entrepreneurial spirit within me too, but dental school kind of like temporarily, I just kind of contained it, you know, and I had to like push, push it, push back, push back, not in dental school. I was never the rene renegade there, but you know, in everything else I did, and you've, you kind of seem like the same way. How did, how did, how did you deal with that during dental school when I know you had that, those animal spirits within you the whole time? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it took me three years to get into dental school, you know, 21 tries. Uh, I, I talk about that a lot. Yeah. Um, but during that very brief period of time, I, I owned my first business. It was a catering truck and I would, uh, you know, I, I purchased a, a franchise actually, but it was, it was a franchise that didn't give a whole lot of, uh, you know, systemization and support. So you, you're kind of on your own. So I took over this lease for this route. And what you would do is drive from construction site to construction site. You'd have a cook in the back and we, I would load it up with, with goodies and treats and snacks and, uh, you know, Cokes and Marlboro lights. We were selling cigarettes at the time. And right. I would go from, <laughs> I would go from construction site to construction site. And just like a, just like a, an ice cream man, I would honk my horn. I would put up the side of, of the, of the truck. And then people, the construction workers would put their hammers down, come over and I would be slinging quarters and dollar bills and grabbing burritos and checking them at them. And it literally was like six minutes per stop all day long, starting at three 30 in the morning. Um, so I learned the the reality of entrepreneurship and the fact that like I didn't have a lot of structure to this, so I had to get creative about you know um, internal marketing and signage and like here was how I would sell more burritos and here is how I could be more profitable by being able to shop it with different vendors and those sorts of things. So I was able to learn the basics of business. Um, and with that, I was also getting my executive MBA at night. So mm -hmm. I was learning formal business and right. then, in the trenches business yeah. at the same time, um, which is invaluable. And I would say, you know, if you were going to ask me a hundred times, I would say 99 out of a hundred times, I would say that the, the, the catering truck experience was more valuable than the actual yeah. executive MBA by it. far because it's real life experience. So when I got to dental school, I was like, I still had all these entrepreneurial juices flowing. And I, and I was, I, I was thinking, yeah, I want to be a multiple practice owner, or I want to have a dental hospital. I want to have a product line. I want to have like electric toothbrushes and I want to, you know, create my own new toothpaste. I had all these crazy ideas, but that's, that's how entrepreneurs think. As you know, very well, David, that's the way we think our minds go in a, a million different directions. And then when you get to dental school, it's such this structured environment and you're talking about millimeters and you're talking about, you know, really, really in-depth sciences and, and, and the human body. So those two things don't mix super well together. Um, and then you get out because you barely have enough time to, to learn enough dentistry, not to hurt people. And then you get out and everybody wants to focus on this clinical stuff that we barely had enough time to practice and the business stuff and the entrepreneurial stuff is just, is put to the side and a ton of dentists, I would say the vast majority of dentists never go back and learn that stuff. Yeah. And so right now, 73 to 76% of dentists, which is down from 85% in 1990 something, 76 ish percent of dentists own their own dental practices. I would say the vast majority of them never got formal business training and don't understand the basics of how to run an effective dental practice. The good news is we have such a valuable skill set that you could still make a couple a couple hundred thousand dollars. And that's a great life. Still good enough to put several kids through school and to pay off a mortgage and, and live an upper middle-class life. But the sad part to me is that there's so much meat on the bone. Like if you're going to spend the time in a dental practice for 20 to 30 years, you might as well maximize the profitability and figure out how to run this thing the right way. If you're going to be spending the time in there. Um, if, if you're leaving 20% on the table, um, year after year, after a 20 year to 30 year career, that's millions of dollars that you're living on, leaving on the table. Yeah, no question about it. What would you say is, it would be the, if there was an ideal, and there's no such thing as an ideal here, so I'm kind of throwing that out, but if there was a ratio between clinical skill set, CE, you know, upping your game there, uh, and the other side being business acumen, let's just put it in a big box, 
is there kind of a, a range of, of, of ratio of, you know, focus, and, and maybe it's different as we go through stages of career. I know you guys have looked at this. I mean, could you explain it better than I am, but is there a ratio that you kind of help people with the, in Dental Success Institute when, when they come in at a certain level? I mean, are they focusing more on business and a little bit less on clinical, or, or, how, or is it just assessed you know, uh, individual by individual? I love this question. This is a great question. And it's not like uh, I can't answer it in a single sentence, but I'll, I'll try to explain um, our philosophy. So our philosophy is we have a, a, a number of different assessments, like how effective are you entrepreneurially um, from a systemization standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from a culture standpoint? Um, you know, it, once we have all of that data, about where you are, we put you in phases. We put you in phases and belt classifications. So we're just like uh, any other martial art. It's a, a no belt, a white belt, a blue belt, a brown belt, or a black belt. And it's phase zero, one, two, three, or four. The phases are associated with the numbers of your dental practice. So if your overhead is 70% and you have zero profitability, you'd be a phase zero practice. It, uh, all the way in the other end of the spectrum, if you have 50% overhead, excluding doctor compensation and 20% EBITDA or profitability, we would consider you, consider you a phase three. And then, then we fold in things like systemization, profitability, and culture into those with the, with the assessments that we have. And so you're anywhere from a phase, uh, I'm sorry, from a, a white belt to a black belt. So when we're looking at these different classifications, it's very, very easy for us to say, okay, in this phase, we need to work on just your general business knowledge. You need to understand how a dollar flows through your practice. You need to understand exactly what your overhead is and the levers to push and pull in order to increase that, uh, increase that profitability and decrease that overhead. How to be more systemized, less chaotic in your dental practice. That would be like, if you are a phase zero to a phase one practice, we're going to focus on that stuff and we're not even going to consider talking to a marketing company or going to get a $25,000 advanced continuing education skill set. Right. Because if we increase the flow that's coming through a broken machine, okay. you're not going to realize all the benefits from that. So when you are a phase zero to phase one, we're working on certain things like business acumen and uh, increasing systemization. Uh, plugging the holes in your bucket, basically. When you get to a phase two or phase three, then we start saying, okay, now is time and we can talk about expanding the number of operatories in your practice. And now would be the time, the appropriate time to go out if you're interested to get advanced ortho education or advanced surgical education or advanced sleep education and s spend a significant amount of money, even on marketing in these different later phases, because you're going to keep more of the benefits of this advanced skill set. So we don't say don't work on an advanced skill set, work on bread and butter and, and turn this into a turn and burn practice. Everybody's different. And I think everybody should really feel free to go out and advance their clinical education, but it has to be done at the appropriate time. Yeah. What I see people do is they're, they're a phase zero practice. Their overhead is 70 to 80%. There's no money in the bank at the end of the month. And so they think, well, the one tool that I know is that I could produce more if I get this advanced clinical education and that that's the wrong order. It's not necessarily the, the wrong tool. It's just the wrong time to utilize that particular tool. Yeah, no, that's very, very well said. Very well said. How, how do you feel about multiple practice ownership today? Cause you've, you've been on the whole spectrum all the way up to 16 and then consolidated back down. I, I you know, I don't know exactly what the flow was, but you're, you're out completely now. I get that. But I know there was a time when you you were expanded to, the, to sixteen, or I guess that was the number at the high high point. And then did that come back down to a point that you ran with for a little for a while, and then you made the exit? What, get, make sure I understand what that what that ramp up was, and then and what what? And I'm curious about the decisions you made about that. Yeah, great question. I um the most practices I ever had at one time was ten. I was managing and owned 10 different, different practices and my practices were in California and in Arizona. So oh, I, wow. I had, I had, uh, traveling regional managers. I had, uh, partners and associates in, in multiple States. So there is nothing simple about this, uh, about the structure of my business. And it, it, it took its toll on me as far as the amount of time that I was spending away from home, 
uh, the amount of stress that was involved with that. We had well over 100 employees at one point. Uh, so there were opportunities when I was at 10 dental practices uh, for certain associates to take over in certain uh, minority ownership positions. And then they eventually bought me out on a handful of practices. There are other uh, small groups in certain areas, uh, be it uh, Arizona or California, that were attractive to uh, larger owners that came and bought, um, you know, small regional chunks of, of my operation. So, you know, some of the practices were super, really, really successful. And some of them were average practices. I'll be super honest. Some of them were four operatory practices that barely were producing a million dollars. Those aren't super sellable to say a DSO or uh, to a large um, conglomerate that wants to absorb you into their organization. So those are very limiting. Like if you're in a rural area, four operatories, million dollar practice, 50% overhead, very difficult to, to um, recruit uh, associates into that area, difficult to sell. So I've had many, many different types of iterations of transitions. Um, I've been very blessed in that it's worked out very well overall, as far as the transitions in general. But uh, they, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, that's for sure. Um, there were some really tough ones. And, and I will tell the people out there that are interested in multiple practice ownership, the way that we do it is we make sure that you are a phase three or better and a black belt uh, mm -hmm. in your flagship primary practice. Maximize the primary practice because that's going to be your franchise prototype, as uh, you know, as the E myth and and Gerber, Michael Gerber would say, that's your franchise prototype. That is the model at which you want to replicate. What I see people do is that they have a white belt or a blue belt level practice. And instead of fine tuning and making this thing a perfect franchise prototype or flagship model, they go out and buy three more. And then you end up with four average practices instead of one great one, and then slowly adding to, uh, you know, to the complement of, of that original base flagship practice. So I think that order is very, very important. Um, there's so many more considerations now um, in this sophisticated landscape with you know consolidation, et, et cetera. It's very, it's very formulaic now. It's like you got to be 45 minutes from a major metropolitan airport. You have to have a minimum of six operatories. You have to have a, a, a minimum of two full-time providers and you know a certain number of hygienists in those in those practices. Um, no Medicaid. There's there's lots of different check marks that didn't exist when I was building a multiple practice, um, multiple practice kind of uh, group. Yeah, the business of dentistry has really become the business of dentistry uh, to a great scale. What what did I know that you do a lot of work with young docs, um, looking at their career, moving coming out of school with massively more debt than than we did, certainly that I did. And how are you consulting, coaching them? Again, they're all different and they all have different uh, personality, pers personalities and drives and some are more entrepreneurial than others. But what's is there a general message you're giving them? Are they, and are they feeling um, a bit uh, misled, deceived? I'm just curious. I don't get a chance to talk to them that much, but what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the feeling out there today? Yeah, uh, I am super blessed that I get to, I'm exposed to a lot of younger dentists and, and D3s, D4s in dental school. Um, average dental stu student debt is $292,000 right now as of 2021, which I think is an underestimation for most of the, most of the dental students that I bump into, particularly if they went to private school, you're looking at, you know, 350 to 550 is probably the, the range that I see more common than not. Um, I think, you know, there is a mixed bag, but generally speaking, I think there's a lot of optimism and a lot of excitement in the, the younger, uh, the younger dental crowd. Um, obviously people that listen to a podcast like yours or mine usually skew younger people that are technology based, um, listen to podcasts. So, um, our audiences skew younger. So I get to speak to a lot of them. Um, I think that my advice, my typical advice to them, uh, when people ask me, um, associateship or purchase immediately or go to a residency or to specialize. It's like, you know, there's, there's a few main things that you can choose from. And, you know, I, I always give the, the 
totally lame answer of it depends. It right. depends on a lot of different things. For me personally, it took me three years to get into dental school. For me, a, a, a residency was not practical. I was a married man that needed to start providing for my young wife and start building a family. So for me, residency was not practical. So I found the right associateship and I treated that like a residency, right? It was in a med Medicaid office, super high volume. I got to know the office manager very, very well. So that, I, that served as a financial and a clinical residency for me, worked out great. Um, I will say that in most cases, unless you went to a very, very clinically based dental school, clinically speaking, most first year dentists are not ready to keep up with the clinical volume necessary to make a startup work or an acquisition work your first year out. Um, and I say, I, I typically tell people in the grand scheme of things, if you're trying to, to accelerate your, your uh, career trajectory, taking, taking an extra year and doing an associateship or a residency is not going to kill the trajectory of your career. In fact, you're building a foundation that first year out. So don't be in such a rush that you need to, to borrow a million dollars to start something without a year of professional dentistry under your belt yet. So that's, that's typically my, my advice to young, young uh, dentists. Yeah, that's really good advice, Mark. Was there a particular turning point I mean, we all have a lot of turning points in our life and, and, and sometimes doors get shut, you know, that we thought we were going down. But was there some turning point or a person or an event? I'm just curious, uh, any point in your life could have been when you were a young kid, you know, with, with your family, your, your your family under your your father and mother or something in your clinical, um, just something you, you, you learned that maybe you weren't expecting and that you feel like made a major, um, helped you make a major pivot or um, pushed you forward on a, on a direction that maybe you, you didn't see. Yeah. I mean, as far as pre-dental school, there's a couple major trajectory moments for me. I ran when I was 16 years old, my very first varsity baseball game, I ran into the left field fence. I lost all of my upper anterior teeth. Um, it took 16 months to put my face back together. Um, and that was when dentistry first came on my radar. So uh, like a kid that was very entrepreneurial minded, didn't have like a definitive plan yet. And that became my plan after that 16 month period where they were, I was in and out of uh, uh, dental practices, uh, you know, specialists and plastic surgeons offices, uh, ortho, endo, uh, pros, they all worked together to put my face back together. And I, I became very, very um, enamored with the profession. So it was six at 16 years old. That was my first trajectory moment. The next trajectory moment was, you know, that whole, three years of struggle to try to get into dental school. And I finally got that acceptance after three years. Um, I, that, that was a trajectory moment because I, I was ready. I was getting my MBA. I was almost done with my MBA. I was ready to go into the, the corporate world. So that was another trajectory moment that kind of went from, from this path to the next path because Marquette gave me a shot. Uh, and then the next trajectory moment was um, when I was actually in dental school. And I recognized that Oh, I don't necessarily fit in with the, just this clinical group of people that only wants to do clinical stuff and would be happy with a single practice. Um, I was more entrepreneurial minded. I believed in quality dentistry and uh, evolving as a clinician, but I knew that there was a, a different plan for me as opposed to to the majority of of my dental school classmates. And it's gone a different way, but um, there's no wrong way to do any of this. Everybody has their own path. Right. right. Yeah, that's the thing. I think I think a lot of people think you have to follow one certain path and you need to you know, buy into one philosophy of this is how you do it, whatever it is. And I think yeah. we, the more we mature in life, at some point we realize that that's not the case and it's okay to be in, unique, okay to be individual, okay to take a different path. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing just because that seems to be the cool thing, right? Uh, big mistake yeah. actually to, to follow, follow that kind of a lead when you don't know who you are. Well, Mark, I know you have um, an, uh, another annual event. Oh, this is number what? This will be uh, the Dental Success Summit coming up in San Antonio, June the 15th, the 17th. This is like number, you're in the teens. What, what number is this now? This is the 10th. Yeah. This right. is the 10th anniversary. Uh, we decided to go away from Scottsdale for a year just because it's kind of a special occasion. So we put it in the middle of the country. It's the, at the La Contera resort in San Antonio. 
Uh, it's June 15th through 17th. A check-in is the 15th. So really it's the 16th and 17th in San Antonio. Um, you know, it, this is our Super Bowl, David. You know, yeah. every year we have, I host 11 events a year, but this is our biggie. Uh, we expect typically to have between 800 and 1,000 people, but this is a more boutique resort. So we're only able to fit between maybe 700 people in there. And last year we had 750. So um, it's going to sell out, but uh, just go to True Dental Success dot com um, and click on the events tab anything that you want to know about uh, business ownership systemization leadership um, all of our black belt coaches we have 16 black belt coaches all of them will be up on stage teaching um, the energy is just incredible i think that uh, anybody that shows up there will will really really get a lot out of it and the networking opportunities are incredible yeah. because it's a very very positive crowd Positive crowd, well attended, and uh, I know a number of your black belt coaches, and they are they're they're top top of the game. Um, you've accrued a a great group of people, and I I agree that's a, that would be an event that I would not want to miss. All right, my okay. last my last my last question to you is: uh, now that you have um, given up the handpiece, do you get like Monday morning jitters or anything like what? <laughs> you're like looking for something to hold on to? You is there is there a sound a buzz in your ear that's missing? And I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you this, that, that, that life away from dentistry is odd. It's, it's nice. It's refreshing. Uh, I loved my clinical career because maybe about six years ago, I was able to kind of pivot away from like the, the hard grind. And I was able to kind of be more selective about the cases and the type of things that I was doing. So I was much more clinically, uh, surgically based rather. Uh, so that was a lot of fun for me. I, we have Colorado surgical, so I, I still get to teach over at Colorado surgical. So I still get my, uh, my hands a little wet. Uh, but what's what's interesting about dentistry, uh, and you may go back, uh, David, when you used to be a clinical dentist, when you are scheduled every 15 minutes to half hour, um, all day long, every single day, uh, when you step away from that structure and that that frenetic pace and that busyness, and you have blocks of time to to cre to create or to do certain tasks, and it's not a 15 minute block, it's a two and a half hour block. It takes a lot of discipline and there's a lot of, um, there, there's a significant transition in mindset that needs to take place. And I think, you know, I'm six weeks into this. I think I'm still in that transitionary mindset space because when I was doing dentistry, I had, you know, several other and still have several other businesses that I was running. So I do dentistry and in between each patient, I was, I had a task. Sure. And at the end of every day, I had three more hours that I had to put in to X, Y, or Z. Now those, those tasks that were squeezed into like teeny little spaces, I have hours to do them now. So hopefully the, 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 uh, with an increased bandwidth, the, the, the volume and quality of everything that I put out there into the world is it increases significantly. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. That's a good question. Well, it's always been fun to follow you. And I know you will continue to put out, um, great content and great teaching and great influence. Uh, uh, your book, The Pillars of Dental Success, and of course, your podcast, The Dentalpreneur Podcast. We'll put all those notes uh, in our show notes and also the summit coming up in San Antonio in June. So Mark Costas, thank you so much for, for being a, a part of our show and uh, contributing as much as you do to the entire world of dentistry and beyond, actually. You know, business is business and you do a great job with that. Thank you, my friend. Hey, I got to say, we do have some, some common friends um, and... I just got to thank you for everything you do for our profession. You have an incredible reputation and I've had the privilege of knowing you for many, many years. And uh, you never, uh, you never cease to amaze me with, with the amount of uh, quality and support that you put out there into our profession. Uh, nobody that I've ever met has a bad thing to say about you and that's rare in dentistry. So, so thank you for everything you do. Well, I just try to surround myself with great people like you do. And I think that's what, what helps us all to, to better ourselves and better what we do deliver to uh, the people we, we care about and want to serve. So thank you as well. And uh, I'll, I'll see you soon. I'll see you in San Antonio. How about that? For sure. All right. I, I can't wait, my friend. I can't wait. Take care. If you enjoyed watching or learning from this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content. If you have a question about any of my content or this specific video, just please leave a comment down below. And as always, stay focused on your freedom. I'll see you next time.